So, I just finished watching Netflix's Shadow and Bone series, and despite its many, many flaws, I loved this show. How could I not adore a show that has as sexy a beard as Ben Barnes? Ziz. And also, the crows are freaking amazing. Come on. Come on. I mean, we stand Jesper here for the hat alone. That's out of, that's out of frame, isn't it? Never mind. That didn't just hit the lights. <laughs> But despite my love for Shadow and Bone, there is one criticism that I want to use my platform to analyze and discuss, mainly around how the show frames systems of race and racism. The conversation around this topic has been honestly deeply nuanced when it comes to the show, and I feel like it deserves to be highlighted, mainly because I feel the conversation has enabled incredibly interesting discussions around depictions of racism and systemic oppression within TV shows, and what messages a show that adds overt racism to a story that didn't originally contain it might have, intentionally or not. Before we dive into this topic, a quick little disclaimer. As should be obvious, I am white, and while as a trans person who is attracted to folks of all genders, I do have some direct experience with systemic harm as a minority, I also don't have the lived experience that people of color do. Nor am I attempting to speak for that experience. Because while there are similarities to an LGBTQ experience, and it's important to talk about that overlap, there are also important differences. And it's important that in these conversations, folks like myself center voices from those who are most affected by the topic at hand. So with that in mind, I want to make clear that one, this video script is mainly informed by criticisms that I've read from people of color, and I had some input from some folks as well on this script. Two, and more importantly, this video is meant to be a primer on these issues for those of my audience who may not have been exposed to them before. But at the end of this video and in the description below, as well as throughout the video, I'm going to cite and share some resources and videos by people of color. And I highly, highly encourage and ask all of you watching this, especially if you yourself are not a person of color, to continue your learning journey by checking them out. And I've directly included them because while I feel I've provided a valid interpretation and critique of the show that's been informed by my own thoughts and mainly criticisms of the show coming from people of color, I don't want to give the impression that there is some sort of monolithic interpretation of Shadow and Bone, especially one from marginalized communities. There isn't. There is always a multitude of conversations, and as often the case with issues like this, the answer is best found within the good faith conversation itself being had, rather than in one singular viewpoint. Also, in a similar vein, it's important to note that while I will be discussing marginalization of folks within the Asian and black communities, for example, throughout this essay, in order to discuss overall dynamics of marginalization, there are important distinctions, nuances, ways in how marginalization happens both to and even within these communities and histories for each. So while again, this video will be a broad overview, it's important to listen to multiple people within multiple communities to fully understand a broad picture of how marginalization happens against minority communities. Again, I encourage all of you to please read more. And with that said, let's begin. Based on the Grisha verse books by Lea Bardargo, Netflix's Shadow and Bone follows Alina, a low-ranking mapmaker working for the First Army of Ravka, a Russian-inspired fantasy country. In this world, some folks, called Grisha, are born with magical powers, and while hunted and hated in other countries, are allowed to live somewhat safely within Ravka, but are forced to join the First Army, where they still face discrimination and racism both from fellow service members as well as Ravkin society as a whole. Sun Summoner is Grisha. Second Army. Let those fancy folk handle her. But at least, you know, they're not actively being hunted down, so that's cool? Alina soon discovers, though, that she has the powers of the Sun Summoner, a fabled Grisha with the ability to conjure light, and who was prophesied to destroy the Fold, a massive zone of darkness filled with dark, scary creatures that has split Ravka in two and separates off many of the different nations of the world from each other. And considering Ravka is at war with many of its border nations and is blocked in by the Fold, prevents Ravka from being held together as one nation and getting much-needed supplies between both sides of their country. However, while most of that is pretty one-to-one -one with the book, one major change the show made was changing the ethnicity of Alina, who is described as presumably white in the books, to being half Shu in the show, Shu Han being a nation that was inspired by China and Mongolia, and one which is at war with Ravka. 
And this change was a conscious choice and effort by both the series showrunner Eric Heinzer and the book author as well. I'm very proud of Shadow and Bone, but I'm also conscious of its shortcomings. I wrote this very white, very straight, chosen one story that was rooted in echoes of what I had grown up reading in terms of fantasy, but certainly didn't reflect the world around me or the world that I live in. We knew we wanted to make some changes there, and it made a lot of sense for us to write Alina as half-shoe. Throughout the series, Alina faces racial slurs and discrimination for her shoe ancestry. Despite being born in Ravka and being half Ravkin herself, she's treated as lesser than and looked down upon for visibly looking like a member of a rival nation. The fold looks different on mine. Maybe to get a better view from your country. She grew up here. Come on. The Shuhan didn't want her either. This is shown, by the way, to be directly racial coded too, because Ravka is at war with other, more European coded countries. But those with ancestries from those nations are far less likely to be discriminated against within Ravka. Cheer going, girl. Sorry. So far from show her, aren't you? So this racialization very much comes down to Asian-coded visual distinguishers. Part of the intention for this change by the showrunners, beyond just increasing the visual diversity of the series, was to make more explicit the discrimination discussion within the show itself. While the Grisha within the series are used as a metaphor for discriminations facing minority groups, the writers hoped that by adding in more direct racial overtones to the series serves to emphasize, reinforce, and make more explicit the series' themes and ideas when it comes to that topic. I really wish we didn't have this spike in anti-Asian sentiment and violence. It's heartbreaking and gut-wrenching. I don't ever know what to think about timing in the moment. My hope is that we can alleviate some of that by showing a character that I think Jesse portrayed quite eloquently and lovely, and was voiced by a team of people including mixed Asian creative members. There's something definitely to be said with making your metaphors more explicit in an age where we constantly discuss how folks not looking for messages like that in their fiction are willing to overlook it if it's not directly in their face, if it's just left to be purely symbolic and metaphoric. However, there are a few issues that folks have discussed in terms of how this racism is framed within the series itself. One of the first and most prominent discussions is around the fact that the racism shown often uses direct, real-life, anti-Asian rhetoric from our real world. For example, characters espousing bigotry towards Alina often insult the shape of her eyes, a common anti-Asian sentiment in the United States and other European countries. God, by making her eyes in a shoe, Miss Seffen. As well as use other common real-world racist phrases like the one I'm about to show. Please skip to the time code below if you don't want to see it, but I just at least want to give you an example of what is used in this show. Well, you run from me, harsh phrase. Stay away from him. Oh, wow. You can control me or I see her. Obviously, racist phrases like that are very much based on direct anti-Asian rhetoric within the real world. And there are myriad discussions back and forth of if the use of real-life anti-Asian rhetoric was appropriate by the series. Anti-Asian rhetoric has always existed in countries like the United States, which we can clearly see in things like the Page Act of 1875, which barred East Asian women from entering the country and prevented existing Chinese-American women from becoming full citizens, or in the Japanese-American internment camps during World War II. And these are just two of many examples, by the way. But we've also seen a marked increase in anti-Asian hate crimes and violence over the past year due to anti-Asian and specifically anti-Chinese rhetoric being extolled by the likes of the Trump administration and conservative groups, who repeatedly do things like calling COVID-19 the China virus, which reinforces white supremacist narratives about the origins of the coronavirus and as well stoking their pre-existing anti-Asian sentiments. And as a result of this, as the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State University has reported, there has been a 164% increase in the number of reported hate crimes in the first quarter of 2021, not to mention the increase in hate crimes in 2020 itself. So, given all of this context going on in the world right now, as well as the long history of it, for Shadow and Bone to depict actual anti-Asian hate within its fantasy setting can not only be hard and triggering for Asian folks to watch in what should be a potentially escapist fantasy series, it also adds and depicts real-life harm in a series which never included it before, and can risk perpetuating said stereotypes. I've talked about before in other videos how even simple depictions of hate on screen, even if it's shown to be a bad thing within the show's narrative ultimately, can still perpetuate the very harm it depicts in the real world. Even further, some argue that because the show only really codes racial issues for Asian-appearing folks, considering some other people of color within the series don't seem to face any racism in this world at all, it can come across as the show highlighting Asian hate only, and allowing others the simple escapist fantasy that they may have been searching for when coming to the show. 
This is something that I definitely do not have an answer on, but it is definitely something that has been discussed and is worth listening to the conversation. Because, on the other hand, the show is obviously not saying that racism is good. And there are also those who argue that the show using its platform to discuss the, the very real pressing issue of anti-Asian racism can be really important. That for a show to show that anti-Asian racism happens and is a bad thing to people who may not have actually sought out that information otherwise can be really effective. And if you're interested more in that discussion, I'd recommend these two videos by folks of Asian descent for two sides of this very debate. However, this discussion can go even further. While Alina faces numerous incidents of anti-Shu racism, it's always presented as an issue facing her and her alone. None of the other main characters in the series, especially the white characters, ever really are seen to have to deal with or even look at racism in this setting, or even what it would mean for racism to exist for these folks. Pretty much all of the racism being shown comes from unnamed or secondary characters within the show, something that Alina must face, but never has to confront or call out within her fellow main characters. For example, this chef who only appears in the scene pushes Alina to the back of the line for her being Shu, and the character of Mal comes and brings her food afterwards. What's a Shu girl doing here? I'm Ravkin, on the cartography team. Back of the line, your friends, too. I don't know them. Can you go? Come on! But Mal never really discusses or addresses the fact that Alina probably regularly faces this type of anti shu sentiment within her own army camp. It's just shown as a one-and-done thing that Mal, her white best friend, can mitigate for her, but never actually has to address himself. He just gets to help her out and then go on his merry way. As a result, no other characters within the show are implicated in benefiting or perpetuating said racial stereotypes, despite this clearly being something that would happen. Later in the story, when Alina is being made presentable to go in front of the nobility of the realm as a sun summoner, some of these servants that are there to make her look nice make racist anti-Asian remarks about Alina's eyes. God, by making her eyes in a shoe, Miss Seffin. However, immediately after, the tailor Lena dismisses them and says this to Alina. I don't care that you're part shoe. I care that you look terrible. <laughs> In this scene, we're meant to see Lena as one of the good ones, someone who is able to dismiss racism around Alina, and who doesn't see Alina for her race. And don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing that she doesn't care about Alina's race, but this scene just kind of dismisses the issue, and again, doesn't force Lena to confront it or address it, just gets to shove it out of the way so that Alina herself can deal with it on her own later on. You're a very special girl, so how has no one looked twice at you before? Are you joking? Maybe it's nicer inside the walls of the little palace, but out here, when you're different, when you look different, everything's at risk of becoming a fight. It places the burden of dealing with racism solely on Alina, who must continually confront it, while white characters seemingly just get to clap their hands and then say, well, I don't see you that way, so we're all good here, and then get to go on their merry way. I'm not saying that white characters would have to confront racism every single day. I mean, that's part of the privilege of being a white person is that you don't have to deal with that. And that's something that we should also discuss. But it just feels weird to me that this show shows that this country is so racially stratified. And yet characters outside of Alina never really seem to exist in that type of world. And in their own scenes and stories, the white characters never seem to have to address or even confront or even think about racism within their own world. It's basically as if they don't exist in a world where racism is clearly shown to exist. Yet, in real life and even within the show, this type of racism is perpetuated by a system in which all the characters find themselves in. For example, we see the Queen perpetuating racist remarks against Alina in front of the entire court. I thought she was shoe. Well, I guess she's shoe enough. And the anti-Shu sentiments against Alina are repeatedly demonstrated to be informed by the fact that Ravka is at war with the Shu Han nation. While the war with the Shuhan isn't really elaborated on within the story of the show other than that it exists, we can presume that at least one of the major reasons that the split country of Ravka has maintained a sense of national unity despite being separated by the fold, and thus maintained an adherence to the king and queen of the land despite it being a split nation, is because of its shared common struggle against the Shuhan. We even see anti-Shu posters in the series, meant to reflect anti-Japanese World War II propaganda. The anti-Shu sentiment and racism is being perpetuated and stoked by the very system that all of them live in in order to continually feed a conflict that benefits the most powerful in keeping their position. Our wars have been a noble pursuit, but this chatter from the West about becoming a sovereign nation, that needs to stop. 
The sooner we are one country again, the better. While characters like Lena and the main series villain The Darkling are both characters that are discriminated against for their Grisha identity, we don't really see any acknowledgement by either of them, as well as any other character within the series outside of Lena, how their ability to attain higher privileged positions within Ravka often comes at the expense of perpetuating the system that directly stokes the fire of anti-Shu sentiment. Anti-Shu sentiment that is directly coded as anti-Asian sentiment. These characters just get to dismiss the racism, saying that it was just a few bad apples, not themselves, that were perpetuating said racism, and leaving Alina to handle its continued effects on her own. And we see this happening within our real world as well. So often, we refuse as a culture to acknowledge the very real systems of systemic oppression and harm that face racial minority groups. For a singular example, and I say singular example because there are many examples, take a look at the criminal justice and policing system in the United States. Psychological stressors combined with police ideology and widespread cultural stereotypes to push officers, even ones who don't hold overtly racist beliefs, to treat black people as more suspect and more dangerous. It's not just the officers who are the problem, it's the society they come from and the things that society asks them to do. This is a much longer discussion than I have time to get really into in this video, and I recommend the article that I just quoted for more uh, deeper discussions of this. But, instead of recognizing things like how police are three times more likely to search black people over white people, or that police officers in certain cities are more likely to use force against black people than white people, we instead chalk up the issue of policing against black people to just a few bad apples within the police department, not something systemic to policing as a whole. The vast, vast, vast majority of police are honorable, decent men and women who risk their lives every single day when they put on that badge and walk out that door. They have a right to come home safely. But there's bad apples in every profession. There are lousy commentators, there are lousy presidents, there's lousy senators, docs, and they should be, in fact, I can think of, I don't know any police department around that isn't happy to get rid of a lousy cop. What this does effectively is wash the hands of those involved from addressing structural problems within these institutions, such as the training of police to view every potential situation as a possible lethal threat to their lives, which then combines with society's racialization and focus on black people as a threat, which then causes police to be more likely to shoot or harm black men over white men. Again, this is one of many intersecting examples here. Such as many cops are not actually willing to quote unquote kick out the bad apples, in fact many will actually cover for them. According to the study, excessive use of force was the most frequent act of misconduct shielded by the code of silence. About half of the 530 officers stated that they had witnessed this and did not report it. According to the survey, 73% of those pressuring officers to keep quiet about misconduct were those with a higher rank. It is not that some police officers aren't doing admirable things in our communities, but revering police officers for not abusing their power is dangerous. It normalizes police violence and numbs society to these issues. The idea that not all cops are bad cops belittles attempts to uproot the system. When we go out of our way to controvert this fight, we are perpetuating the inherent problems with racialized policing. But even further, instead of just ignoring systemic harm, we often see, especially in conservative circles, active denial that things like systemic racism even exist. Systemic racism does not exist. There are no laws in America, meaning the system, doesn't mean racism doesn't exist. Racism exists. There are people who are racist, and you should do everything you can to show them that their ideas are wrong, and that you should not be judging someone based on their race, of course. But the idea that there is systemic racism, meaning that there are laws in place that treat black people differently or Asian people differently or white people differently, simply doesn't exist. By actively denying systemic harm's existence and placing it as an issue of individuals, it prevents those who benefit or at the very least aren't most actively vulnerable to these systems to ignore them. We need to acknowledge that where systems of systemic racism exist, white people often benefit. Whites calling the police do not endure long response times, treatment that negates their victimization, or the slide from victim to suspect in the eyes of the police. They may even get a sense of personal efficacy in seeing the state perform its basic function of protecting them. As Charles Epp and his colleagues wrote in their book Pulled Over, which grew out of a large representative survey analysis of white and black drivers, even when whites have involuntary contact with police, they overwhelmingly experience police as helpful, benevolent, fair, and efficient problem solvers. This mismatch in experience equates to powerful incentives for people of one racial group to call the police on others who could be seen as breaching quote, white spaces. It's also a powerful disincentive for black people to call the police in almost any situation except when their lives depend on it. 
Most white Americans have little doubt about the distorted responsiveness likely to occur when they call the police on black people. They know, without having read the scores of studies on the subject, that whites are seen as more law-abiding by officers of the state, and that blackness itself is construed as suspicious and threatening. Nothing in the world is easier in the United States than to accuse a black man of a crime, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote bluntly. The use by a white student at Yale to evict a fellow black student from a common area in a dorm is notable for how the police responded to each student. The video shows plainly that the white caller was not questioned about her purpose in calling 911. She was not asked for ID, let alone detained. The police seemed wholly uninterested in her. They seemed oblivious to the possibility that she made a false report or was motivated by bias regarding who belonged in, quote, her space. Given her experience of swift police response, and the fact that four officers were dedicated to resolving her complaint, she would probably call again in the future. She is not likely to face repercussions based on, quote, false reporting statutes, as these have been unevenly applied at best. American legal history is replete with evidence of white people saying black people committed a crime, which the legal scholar Catherine Russell Brown terms racial hoaxes, to distract police from their own criminal activity, to maintain control of white space, to retaliate against black people for violating unspoken racial codes, or simply just because they can. But it's not just important for white people like myself to recognize our own complicity in these systems just for its own sake, but because recognizing our complicity and our benefit from these systems actually spurns action in wanting to stop it. In many of these studies, as whites came to understand themselves as members of a racial group that enjoyed unearned privileges and benefits, this compelled them to forge a different sense of white identity built on anti-racism rather than simply supporting the status quo. Moving away from the colorblind ideology that sociologists critique, the idea that it's admirable to profess not to see color, that it's problematic to see oneself as a member of a racial group, is, according to the research in this area, actually an important step to anti-racist activism. As that article shows, and as studies back up, white people like myself recognizing that we are actually complicit, intentionally or not, within a system that harms and continually perpetuates violence against minority racial groups, it helps to create a desire to want to stop that very system. Without this acknowledgement of our own complicity in perpetuating racist and bigoted systems, oftentimes some white people will not feel a desire to spurn on actions against these very systems. And as a result, it's left to people of color to deal with the very harm being perpetuated against them without allies to help them. Allies who are much less vulnerable to being hurt within these systems, and who often hold more societal power in order to stop these systems. Back in Shadow and Bone, it's left to Alina alone to refute and push back against racism. In the season 1 finale, Alina stands up to the villain General Kiergan and pushes back the fold with her power, saying, This is what I am. This scene is a refutation of the discrimination and racism faced by her throughout the entirety of the season. Not only is she standing up to racism at that moment, she's actively saving the entire nation of Ravka. She's both standing up to the issues within her country, but protecting it at the same time. And this was a direct intent by the author again. When you have a character who is visibly an outsider, who has been treated shabbily, who has been told repeatedly that she looks like the enemy, to then be thrust into the role of saving a nation that has rejected her on many terms, I think that makes this story much richer and more powerful. As a result, this somewhat implies that the entire burden of stopping the system is upon Alina herself. No other characters have to endure what she does, or have to address their own complicity in the system that perpetuates it. But ultimately, Alina's suffering is portrayed as a worthwhile struggle that results in the benefit of the entire of Ravikin society by her elimination of the Fold. She struggled and persevered, and even though the people around her treated her like crap, she did the right thing in the end and saved us all. Something similar, by the way, happens in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. In that show, we learn that the character of Isaiah Bradley, a black man, was forced to endure horrible experiments during the Korean War to try to recreate the super soldier drug serum. After gaining powers, he uses them to rescue several of his squad mates. But instead of being rewarded for this, Bradley is then imprisoned and then forgotten. His life is destroyed at no fault of his own, because the country that he lived in only saw him as a black man to be used and disposed of. And what did I get for saving their lives? For the next 30 years, they experimented on me, trying to figure out why the serum worked. However, at the end of the series, Bradley is given a statue celebrating his efforts and sacrifices, quote, for this country. Now they'll never forget what you did for this country. 
Never. In both of these shows, the racism and discrimination that Isaiah and Alina suffered was depicted as being endured and overcome for the benefit of their home country, without really addressing or acknowledging that these very countries perpetuated the harm against them in the first place for their own benefit. Nor does it address the fact that neither Isaiah or Alina chose to endure that suffering in the first place, or chose to make those sacrifices or fight those battles, but were forced into them because of the way the country treated them. They didn't have a choice, but this is constantly the place that many minorities are put into, forced to have empathy for people who don't have empathy for them. But let's pull back a little bit to talk about this in the real world. After the conviction of former police officer Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, the murder that sparked numerous protests around the world this past summer in 2020, United States House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi commented, Thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice, for being there to call out to your mom. How, how heartbreaking was that? Call out for your mom. I can't breathe. But because of you and because of thousands, millions of people around the world who came out for justice, your name will always be synonymous with justice. But Pelosi's words are incredibly revealing of how many folks in culture writ large, especially within white communities, view the pain and suffering that black folks face. Because in that quote, she's kind of implying that George Floyd had a choice in his death that he willingly sacrificed himself to show all of us the horrors of police brutality. I mean, look at the way she frames the sentence. He sacrificed his life. He was there to call out to his mom. All of these words imply active agency by Floyd, but he didn't have active agency. In fact, that's the whole point of why his death sparked so many protests last summer, that he had no agency or choice in his death at the hands of Chauvin nor did he have the ability to choose to live in a society that constantly dehumanized him as a black man and limited his agency and choices in everything that he tried to do and perpetually placed him in life or death situations whenever he was even in proximity with the police in any capacity. Nor do any people within any racial minority communities who live in a society that systemically harms them have agency in choosing when or not they are discriminated against. They don't get to choose to have bigotry used against them or when violence is inflicted upon them. But by implying that they do, and ignoring white people's complicity in creating, perpetuating, and benefiting from these systems, it subtly changes the conversation away from how these systems are created and perpetuated, and shifts them onto how people react to these systems. It's interesting to me that in both Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Shadow and Bone, both of the main villains of the series are themselves victims of metaphorical systemic harm. The Darkling himself is a Grisha who, spoilers, was the one who created the Fold which he made after being hunted for his power and had his lover murdered right in front of him for their statuses as Grisha. Carly and the Flag Smashers and Falcon and the Winter Soldier are a revolutionary group fighting to stop the forced migration and lack of resources for displaced people after the blip depicted in Avengers Endgame. I've talked about this in another video, but in both shows, the main arc of the series for the villains is more focused on critiquing members of marginalized communities who went too far or were too violent in their tactics in fighting back against the harm and relegate the most powerful beneficiaries of these systems, the people who have caused these revolutionary groups to want to exist in the first place, to minor background characters. The King and Queen of Ravka barely appear in a single scene in Shadow and Bone, and the Senators of Falcon and the Winter Soldier only show up near the end of the series and are shown to be the ones that need to be saved at the hands of the evil Flag Smashers. Despite holding all the power, despite the fact that they're the ones that are creating the situation to begin with, they're mainly just pointed at and told to do better, or just acknowledged to be pretty scummy. The Queen, her royal bossiness, Tatiana, has absolutely no regard for my need to sleep. She woke before dawn and demanded I touch up her face before the rest of her team arrived. You know, I can accidentally blind her in the demonstration if you like. Instead, we are made to see the fictionalized, marginalized groups both within the show as potentially going too far or becoming too violent and dangerous. The two of us, together, together, we can end all wars. We can protect our own. Is that not what you want? I'm not necessarily saying that violence is always justified, but it is interesting to me that that's where we focus our attention on, the people being harmed and policing their tactics rather than looking at the people who caused it in the first place. Now, almost certainly, 
further issues of race will come up in future MCU movies or in the next few seasons of Shadow and Bone. But within the confines of these single seasons of the show, which are telling a complete story in and of themselves, we're meant to feel a sense of cathartic release that Sam or Alina have at least addressed in their own refutation of racial impacts committed against them, have done so in a satisfying and conclusionary way. We get the relief as the audience that, ah, everything has been dealt with and all is fine. Yeah, we may get hints for future little projects in an after credit scene, but for the moment it's like, yeah, we did it. We beat the racism. We called it out and we finished. And the people who were doing it the wrong way, well, we stopped them. But we didn't really deal with the actual issues at play. The people who perpetuated these systems are still in power. Yeah, we told them to do better or just kind of ignore them in Shadow and Bone's case, but they still exist. They still have the power. The racism and these systems will still be perpetuated. And even worse, there's no one that's actually actively fighting these things. The revolutionary groups that were fighting these systemic oppressions are both wiped away or at least stopped by the end of both shows. Now, to be fair, these shows do have future installments, and I will be very interested in how both franchises potentially address and move forward with these criticisms and issues in those future installments. And there is a chance that they may deepen the discussion. But from where we are in both franchises at the moment, this is the potential takeaway from where they leave the audience. And it's one that sadly echoes some darker implications from real life society, intentional or not by the writers. Because in real life, we kind of do much the same. We, as a culture, constantly center the conversation around how minorities handle and push back against systemic oppression, rather than discussing the actual issues they're fighting back against. For example, when the Black Lives Matter protests broke out across the United States last year, one of the main narratives being attempted to be pushed was how dare these protesters use looting and violence as a tactic. And they should be, in fact, I can think of, I don't know any police department around that isn't happy to get rid of a lousy cop because it just reflects on them. And by the way, the same with the protesters. It's a right to protest peacefully, but once you pick up a bat and start smashing windows, once in fact you light something on fire, once you engage in violence, you should be arrested and held accountable. Notice how in this statement, Biden equates police acting badly to protesters acting badly, saying they're about the same equivalently morally. By saying that this is a problem of just a few bad apples in the police, it's saying that it's the same thing as a few bad apples in the protesters, without really recognizing that the police are much more powerful and hold much more power in society and systemically harm people that are in the protest group. There's a distinct power difference and imbalance, but by saying it's individuals' problems on both sides, it ignores this distinct power imbalance between the two. Not only that, it ignores what's actually happening. This ignored the fact that looting and violence finally got attention brought to this issue, and also ignored the fact that most protests around the country were peaceful. And when they did become violent, it was often because police instigated said violence. But because the burden of dealing with said oppression is never leveled against those perpetuating it or those complicit in those systems, the criticism and shaming of how to handle an event like George Floyd's death, the protests, or when those protests became violent at the hands of the police, was placed at the feet of those who were most harmed by it. And by the way, I'm using the Black Lives Matter protests here because they're an example that I feel many of us are familiar with. But this dynamic is not exclusive to them. In fact, the Black Lives Matter movement this past summer was actually more able to repel these narratives than ever before because the larger cultural narrative have finally started to get to the point of recognizing that systemic harm exists, as well as the fact that we had a lot of video cameras that could show, no, it's not the protesters that are starting this. And in fact, most of the actual brutal acts are being done by the police. And even despite all of that, the Black Lives Matter protests were still not immune to this criticism. And to this day, we're still only seeing how effective these protests really were in moving the needle forward in this conversation culturally. And the only definitive answer to that question though is still not far enough. It's clear that Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Shadow and Bone were both trying to address a distinct lack of diversity in both of their respective franchises. Shadow and Bone for not including many people of color in the books themselves, and the MCU for a distinct lack of people of color as lead superhero characters outside of a select few like Black Panther. And as a result, both tried to use pre-existing structures, narratives, identities, and characters to try to directly confront the issues of race within their stories and their worlds with Falcon taking on the role of Captain America and Alina being changed from her depiction in the book. And this is by no means a bad thing overall. 
It's awesome to see people using these platforms to directly highlight and include more diverse people from diverse backgrounds and actually be willing to discuss what that would mean. At least be willing to take that on instead of just doing it and saying like, oh look, we made a black man Captain America. Isn't that great? But as a result, both depicted individual acts of racism and discrimination without actually addressing why racism and discrimination exists within the world of their shows. As a result, both shows put up the trappings of racism without really adequately addressing where they come from and fail to implicate other characters around these characters as either benefiting from, being complicit in, or at the very least existing within societies that perpetuate these systemic oppressions. And at the same time, the show uses fictional depictions of marginalizations to say to people who are pushing back against these systemic harms that they need to do it the right way, to do it better. And ultimately, this feeds into the narrative that we find constantly in not only our fictions, but more importantly, in real life. That racial and other minorities are solely responsible for dealing with harm caused by systemic oppression against them. Racist systems that in many cases we don't even want to acknowledge exist instead of being more interested in actually talking about where these systems come from, who benefits from them, and how we can stop them together. It stops those of us who need to recognize that we are complicit in systems like this, intentionally or not, to look at it head on and understand that we have to have a vested interest and responsibility to try and help take these systems down. Because that's what we need to do. Realize that this isn't just a struggle meant to be fought by those who are most harmed, or by singular people, but is one that we must all come together to fight because it is a responsibility of those who benefit and are complicit in these systems to put ourselves on the front line in order to protect the most vulnerable, but never speak for them or over them. And on that note, I want to end on this note. This video touched upon specifics of anti-Asian racism or police brutality used against minority racial communities and especially the black community. But as a whole, it mainly was focused on the systems and philosophy behind why these ideas are perpetuated against racial minorities. Again, as a white person, I don't have the lived experience of those who actually face this in real life day to day. So as I said, I've mentioned a few other videos and articles throughout this video from members of those communities. And those, along with several others, are linked below in the description for you to continue to learn more. Please, 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 please seek them out. Please watch them. Do not let this video just be the end of your journey. Let it be the beginning because I by no means should be the only or even main voice that you hear on this topic. Again, I just want this video to be a starting place for people who may not be exposed to these ideas otherwise. But beyond that, thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more discussions like this. I also have a secondary channel, Jesse Gender After Dark, where I do reviews of TV shows and geek out and nerd out a bit different stuff. I even have a full review of season one of Shadow and Bone over there if you're interested. But again, save that for later. Go and check out the other videos first. I also have a Patreon where you can help support me doing what I do. But beyond all of that, I hope that you, as always, Live long and prosper. It's time for Pride Month and time to celebrate my Patreons. Catherine Lambeth, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, Yo, Eli Bergmoss, Morgan the Pirate Queen, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, James Elizabeth, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Barbara Ruski, Samuel Howard, Felicia Toast, Alex, Boy to Mary Beth, Earl Wellington Marcus, Stephen Schuhart, Kate Mikitine, Bush, April Struck, Base, A Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Corian Vale Honkinen, James Krivda, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, But Near, Jessica Wright, Jared Johnson, Peter Landers, Ferengito, John Steele, Carmen Olson, Meadow Whisperer, William Stewart, Maggie the Goblin, Ulysses the Pagan, Melinda Walters, Joy A, Alex Ogren, Barbara Helchuk, Heoresis, The Auth 13, Jason Knott, John Weatherby, Celestial Dawn, Lamia, Sky Skinner, Andrew K, Maeve, Nathan Steele, Sean Piper, Tiffany Danger, Flynn, Troy Stull, Sky Do Dodo, Amanda Comet, Ava Canivia, Geek Filter, Janie Peckard, Polymena Din, Laura Demereau, Marina Carr, Gretchen Badger, Ellie O'Dare, Sarah Bystam, 
W. Randy E. D. Jacob Tovar, Strawberry Pop Tart, Keith Briggs, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Lysa, Mountain Harpy, Jessica Chapman, Andrew Lamoro, Sarah Sweeney, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Emily Loomis, Mari Mack, Zone One Librarian, Ver, Jenny Mabel, Michael Hardy, Pasty, Michael Goaty, Philip Hawkins, Andy H. You're the best. I love all of you. You're freaking amazing. Thank you so much for making this possible. Happy Pride, everybody.